is the thing that causes non-locality to occur? We believe the ether, the ether must be the manifestation of it. Other people also think it's thought, but the Copenhagen interpretation would say that it's information that's being encoded. I think that's going to be going away. We're getting to something that's more metaphysical than that. And what if, what is entanglement if light is not a photon or a particle? This is what I love the most, guys. What if, when we think about entanglement, we're always thinking about this particle is connected to this particle. But what if that's not it at all? When you think of it as the ether, it's not that this particle is connected to this particle. What we're doing is we're creating a ripple in the medium. That's what entanglement is. I've created a ripple in the medium and I'm seeing the two ends of the ripple. I'm just not seeing the pass through because it's in an extra dimension. And so the, what we're trying to figure out here from this paper, as we go into it, how do we produce entanglement? And yes, so the person said longitudinal. Yes, longitudinal standing wave. That's what we're trying to produce. Produce a longitudinal standing wave. And are you producing a gravitational ripple? Are you producing a ripple in the ether? What are you producing exactly? What we just saw in the MH370 video is a gravitational ripple in the ether. That's why it looks like the plane is flying through a mirror. The reason why the plane looks like it's not there, just vanishes without disturbing the medium, is because it's blipping straight through the medium. It's a longitudinal wave, like a funnel. Like that thing went down a drain and it appeared somewhere else. It's literally one of these. Boom. So what we need to find out is how do we rebuild the wave function? We know how to collapse it. We know how to collapse the wave function. That's easy. We look at it, make a measurement, the wave functional collapse. How do we rebuild it though? Can we even rebuild it? Well, we know the answer is yes, because we just saw them teleport an airplane. The question is how? Right in the introduction, this paper reviews quantum entanglement non-locality considers the possibility that this phenomenon could be used for sending observer to observer signals. So observer to observer signals is basically just communication, but it could also be like teleportation in theory. Such demonstration would break several quantum no signal theorems. Non-local quantum signaling would have far reaching implications as an enabling technology for superluminal and retrocausal signaling. So you could theoretically have faster and light communication, uh, and you could also have going back in time communication as well. That's what that's saying right there. The applications of retrocausal signaling and real-time space communication are considered. Also considered briefly is the non-local communication implications of non-linear quantum mechanics. That's a nice little tease at the end there. Guys, you know what nonlinear quantum mechanics is? That is phase conjugation. That is phase conjugation they're talking about. Tom Bearden, gravity manipulation. Classically, if I have two waves that overlap perfectly, cancel each other out, we would say there's nothing there. They canceled each other out. The phases perfectly canceled each other out. There's nothing there. But in nonlinear quantum mechanics, it says there's, there's actually something left over there, something very small that's left over. The stress in the medium, right? If I pull the rubber band equally on both sides, you would say there's no net force. But now just double it, triple it. Eventually, this rubber band's going to snap. So is there really no net force or is there something else there? when I pull equally on both sides. That is the nonlinear quantum effect. Non-locality was first highlighted by Albert Einstein, Boris Podolsky, and Nathan Rosen in their famous EPR paper. So when you want to know why I'm saying EPR, ER equals EPR, these are the guys. EPR, Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen. They argued that the non-local connectedness of quantum systems was unphysical in that it implied a faster-than-light connection in apparent conflict with special relativity. Despite their objection, quantum non-locality has now been demonstrated in many quantum systems, and the physics community is now generally acknowledged to be implicit 
in the quantum formalization as applied to the entangled systems. Although there remain a few Copenhagen holdouts, Hagen holdouts who would require an explicit demonstration of signaling before admitting that it can be considered a real effect. So basically, it's over for the quantum, uh, the Copenhagen interpretation. Things aren't real. And we do have this weird non-local uh, effect that occurs. Like if we have entangled two things, what what does that mean? <laughs> well, okay, what, you've entangled them. So if I do something over here, something over here happens. But what is that something? The quantum entanglement condition is usually a consequence of some conservation law acting within the system so that the subsystems are connected by the conserved quantities. Yes. Guys, remember how my name's Ashton Four Orbs? Well, it might become Ashton Six Orbs. What have I been saying about the teleportation? There's an equal amount of charge on one side of the equation as the other. When we're entangling these things together, we're forcing them to come together because we're creating these entangled orbs. And on one side, we have three orbs spinning around the plane. And then on the other side, we either have three orbs spinning this way, or we just have one orb over here that's got you know three times the charge. We're entangling these things together through space and time. For example, if two photons are emitted back to back in a joint state that has zero angular momentum and positive parity, then whatever linear or circular polarization state one photon is measured to have, the other photon must have an identical polarization if measured in the same basis. So go ahead and measure your thing, and whatever's happening in one must also happen in the other location. So that if you were to add them up, they cancel out. This condition must exist to ensure that the net angular momentum of the two photon states is zero. So add up the net angular momentum, got to be zero. I love science and physics because conservation is everywhere. Guys, why is the plane not being annihilated? Why is the plane not being annihilated in the MH370 videos? Because of conservation. Because of conservation. That energy has to go somewhere. That mass has to go somewhere. It didn't just disappear. It has to reappear somewhere else. And it didn't reappear as an explosion that destroyed the whole planet. So it probably reappeared in one single form. Now, here's an example of one of the 1972 designs. And right off the bat, you can see they're basically shooting a beam here in the top right. It's splitting between two beam senders or whatever, and then they're going down these different paths, right? That's what usually the double slit experiment shows and pretty much all versions of this show. So what are we doing? Is that we take our photon and we split it down two paths. That's the first step of what we do in any double slit type of experiment. When we're doing these non-local quantum experiments, we split it. They're entangled. And then we send them down different paths. Okay. And then usually what we do is we send this one down this path over here. And then we say, we're going to give it more choices. We're going to say it can go here. It can go here. Or it can actually go way over here to the other path, the other path that was already decided. So we give it like three choices. And we say, now this photon, you're going to pick one of these directions. And I don't care which direction, whichever direction you want to go. And we do that. And when you do that, you rebuild the wave function. Remember the double slit experiment that we just looked at? The interference pattern comes back. So you go from having this photon that got separated out by itself, where we can, we're can we watching this photon, and then we send it through another beam splitter that splits it into three random directions. And then we look at the, inter we look at the patterns on the detectors and we go, whoa, there's an interference pattern there now. There wasn't an interference pattern before, but now there is. What did we do? We created decoherence. We created decoherence. The electron was coherent when it was flowing, or the photon was coherent when it was flowing through, and then we gave it random directions, and we made it decoherent. In fact, 
I want to take another, I want to make another claim here. I think I was right in my first letter to Congress in October of 2023. I said that what we were looking at was macroscopic quantum decoherence. And I ended up flipping and going, no, it's macroscopic quantum coherence. It's actually both. The plane is becoming decoherent, macroscopic phase conjugation. The plane is becoming a wave. And then it's decoherent. It's teleporting through the ether to the other side. And it's becoming coherent again. Does non-locality violate special relativity? Special relativity saying that we can't go back in time. Einstein and relativity was the best thing Einstein ever came up with. Shows that time is a dial. The answer is no. Non-locality does not violate special relativity. The prohibition of signals with superluminal speeds by Einstein's theory of special relativity is related to the fact that the definite uh, simultaneity, simultaneity of two separated space-time points is not Lorentz invariant. Since some hypothetical superluminal signal could be used to establish a fixed simultaneity between two, uh, between two points, for example, by clock synchronization, this would imply a preferred inertial frame and would be inconsistent with Lorentz invariance and special relativity. The problem is this. Special relativity says you can't make a permanent connection between this point and this point that's super far away. Because if you do that, reality breaks down. Doesn't work. Doesn't work. So you cannot cheat is what special relativity says. It says you can't make a permanent connection between like my hand right here and Zeta Reticuli over here. Because if I had a permanent connection between these two points, I can do weird time travel stuff that isn't gonna, we're not gonna be able to reconcile. Too many paradoxes. That's actually really cool. So the author is saying that special relativity doesn't allow us to have a fixed point between two locations. But, however, if a non-local signal could be transmitted through measurements at separated locations performed on two entangled photons, the signal would be sent at the time of the arrival of the photon in the location in one location and received at the time of arrival in the other photon by varying the path lengths to the two locations these events could be made to occur in any order and time separation in any reference frame wow <laughs> what that's saying right there is that you can manipulate the experiment that the uh, the quantum entanglement experiment that I showed and and just add path length. All you have to do is add path length, make the light go a further distance. And just mathematically, you can show that the signal should arrive before it was even sent. Don't worry, I'm going to show you the math here in a little bit. I think one of these screenshots has it. Therefore, non-local signals could not be used to establish a fixed simultaneity between a relation between two separated space and uh, points because the sending and receiving of such signals do not have fixed time relations. The transmission and arrival instance of a non-local signal cannot be used for synchronization because the transmission and reception instance are path and delay dependent variables. Holy, this paper is amazing. What is it saying right there? You can't make a permanent faster than light connection. You can't have a permanent one. Why? Because this point and this point don't have fixed time intervals. <laughs> There's nothing to tie them together in space time, but you can create a temporary transition. You can create a temporary transition, just not a permanent one. The reason why we're not watching the plane go through uh, like a hypergate or whatever the hell, like a big gate or a portal, is because you can't, this paper says straight up, you can't make a stargate like this, at least not right now. They didn't have the technology to do it, but they did know that you could make a blip 
They did know that you could blip something from one location to the next. This one right here, like when I read this, I just seen it going, everything's a lie. Like what is happening? Just wow. <laughs> right there, chat, the dirds. So here's an example of the double slit experiment here. This isn't really one of the better ones. The reason why I actually took this screenshot is that it explained coherence. It should be clear that a point-like source has perfect coherence. That is why I took this screenshot. That is such just, it's like a small thing that's thrown in there, but it's so important. When we talk about entanglement, we have to talk about coherence. We talk about in terms of coherence. Are you coherent? If you're coherent, you are physically here in our reality and I'm looking at you. If you're decoherent, then you're a wave function and you could be anywhere. And now, like I, my mind was reeling when I read that. Why? Because I just can't stop thinking about coherent matter wave beams. Saying uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. On and myself uh, is really Mo's idea, uh, but I helped him with that. Uh, this is a way of generating Ch chat. Look in the bottom right figure. Look at the bottom right figure. That's coherence. Look at that peak. That's the Ehrenhoff Bohm effect. When he's talking about the Ehrenhoff Bohm effect, he's talking about creating a blip in the ether just like we're talking about in this fast from light communication, just like we're talking about with teleportation, this patent, those orbs are Lockheed Martin orbs, chat. Those orbs are Lockheed Martin orbs. They used a coherent matter wave beam. That's the design. A matter wave beam. So rather than a laser beam, it's a matter beam with fermions. And we're using our Harnoff bomb effect to put things, fermions in coherence which sounds like, well, that doesn't sound like that would work um, because there's an energy, there's, um, you can modify the fermions with no energy exchange. And so uh, we predict that we'll be able to put those uh, in coherent and generate a beam. And people have done those with Bose-Einstein condensates, you know, at very low temperature. But using one of those uh, constraints, um, Lorentz invariance, well, that, that fermion uh condensate is a beam in a different re reference frame so in my mind this is my favorite part reference frame so the reference frames chat what is he talking about reference frames chat he's talking about general relativity he's talking about einstein he's saying that well if you look at it from a different perspective from a different reference frame you actually theoretically can allow fermions to collapse down onto a single point it is, it is actually allowed from Einstein's general relativity. And that shows you can uh, build a beam out of fermions a uh, million times more powerful than a laser plus atomic scale manufacturing and, and maybe um, transport of matter over a, a distance. Well, that, that fermion uh, condensate is a beam in a different re reference frame. So in my mind, that shows you can uh, build a beam out of fermions a uh, million times more powerful than a laser plus atomic scale manufacturing and and maybe um, transport of matter over a, a distance. Transporting matter over a distance. <laughs> Transporting matter over a distance using the Ehrenhoff Bohm effect chat. What does that mean? That means literally teleporting stuff. Like literally I'm going to transport the matter from here bloop, and it's going to appear bloop over here.